Good morning, students. So first, going into the topic, before going into the topic, I just want you to understand what is meant by a school of psychology. I already told you, school is something which is like a group of scientists who together compose theories or something and they formulate into a thought of psychology. So today we are going to see about Gestalt school of thought in psychology. So what is meant by Gestalt? What is Gestalt? You might have been wondering what is Gestalt and what is this Gestalt school of psychology. So we will see that in detail. We will give a small introduction about that and the, about the major thinkers and then we will see about the Gestalt laws and the merits and criticism and conclusion in the following episode. Next. So what is meant by Gestalt psychology? Gestalt is not the name of the psychologist. It is actually a German word and it means shape, form or complete. Or whole ala complete if you say something, no, that is called as Gestalt. So in Gestalt school of psychology, the thought generally focuses on a unified or a whole. So anything if you are just viewing it in a like from a distant angle, you will be viewing it as a whole and not as separate parts. That is what Gestalt is trying to say. So what he is trying to say is, rather than breaking down thought, mental process and behavior into small elements, we can consider that as a whole. That is what Gestalt is trying to say. So the main major theory of this Gestalt psychology is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So that is the important thing. So I told you already, the same thing, it will be modified in the next one, that is, the whole is different from the sum of its part. So what is that whole is greater or whole is different? So whole is nothing but the entire thing, the entire thing as the complete thing of uh, which we think, the thought which we think, no, that is called as a whole. So that whole process is generally greater or it is different, obviously it will be different from the sum of its parts. So just go back, go back, back. So in this slide, see this is a fragmented part of a bicycle, so these are the parts of that bicycle. But still if you see it as a whole, it is a bicycle but still as a parts, it is different from that and it is greater from that. That is what Gestalt is trying to say. And then major thinkers, so who and all will be called as thinkers, like I told you that since it is a school of uh, psychology, many thinkers would have contributed in the psychological thoughts and all, they will be just implementing their thoughts. So the major thinkers are. Max Werthimer and he is called, this guy, he is called as the father of Gestalt psychology and then there is Wolfgang Kohler and Kurt Levin. So we will see what each of them said. First one is uh, Max Werthimer, so his time being is, uh, timeline is from 1800s to 1943. So about him, he is an Austro-Hungarian psychologist and a philosopher and he was the one to create this phi phenomenon. I will tell you what is a phi phenomenon. You would have heard about this phi. Phi is actually a symbol in mathematics, but still that phi is different from this phi. This phi is like, this phenomenon is basically what you know, it is a perceptual illusion where the immobile objects, you know, it will be seen as moving, you can see it like it is moving like that. For example, there are different dots over here and the yellow dot, if you just see, focus on that yellow dot, it has moved from this point to that point, that is what your mind will process it like that. So that is called this uh, phi phenomenon. So again I am repeating, it is a perceptual illusion in which people see motion that is produced by a succession of immobile images. So I told you already in that image also. The blue, the blue, the blue, blue dots, they didn't, they didn't complete a circle, but still you will be able to visualize them as a moving pattern or they'll be moving. So that, pro that phenomenon is called as the phi phenomenon. And this uh, Max Werthimer, he worked on this phi phenomenon and he published this in his uh, book called Productive Thinking. And then comes Wolfgang Kohler. Wolfgang Kohler is a phenomenologist and a German psychologist. So according to him, insight, I think, yeah, insight, insight is the major thing which he is focusing on. So what is an insight? Insight is a deeper understanding or researching about some topic deep into it and you are just analyzing it. So that is insight basically. So learning basically occurs through this insight process. That is what he is trying to say. We will see what is that, okay. So insight learning, I told you already Wolfgang Kohler was the first psychologist to develop this insight learning process. That experiment, he conducted an experiment to uh, uh, just show what is this insight learning. So he took the experiment with two apes, two monkeys. So what he did was two rooms, separate rooms were kept and one monkey was uh, locked in one room and another monkey was uh, locked in another room and there was a fruit hanging at the top. So both the monkeys like they could not uh, reach that fruit and they were jumping and jumping and jumping but still but still they couldn't uh, reach that uh, particular fruit so what uh, he did was he tried uh, giving them some uh, some solutions or not so he placed 
two sticks, one longer stick and one smaller stick in one room and in another room he kept some two or three boxes. So what happened, the monkey, it sat down after trying a couple of times, it just went back, sat down and it was thinking what could be done. So that time this insight learning comes in. So what happened, the monkey, one monkey took a bigger stick and it joined it with the smaller stick and it striked out that uh, fruit and it ate it. And the other monkey, what it did was, it piled up the uh, boxes one by one, one above the other and it climbed over it and then it took the fruit. So what happened here? So that is what, see, uh, important aspect of learning is not reinforcement. Reinforcement is rewarding, but the coordination of thinking. So your mind has to think to create a solution for that particular uh, problem. So that's it. And then Wolfgang, Wolfgang Kohler's experiment and yeah, the same thing is experimented. He has just told you, I told you know, two sticks and three boxes were there. Yeah, this, this, is, this, this is the symbol, uh, picture of that monkey. This monkey is joining that longer stick with the smaller stick and this monkey is uh, climbing, uh, putting up these uh, piles of boxes and then uh, just climbing it and then taking that fruit. So this is that one. They're just explaining that. Next is Kurt Levin. So Kurt Levin is, an, I told he's another thinker of this Gestalt psychology. So his timeline is from 1890 to 1947. He is a German American psychologist and he expanded like uh, many theories were there on Gestalt school of psychology and he expanded that theory. So he was the first person to use this Gestalt theory in uh, human beings because we saw already Wolfgang Kohler he was experimenting on monkeys and apes and others were like generally they were just talking about the behavior but still Kurt Levin was the first person who experimented it on the human beings. So what he did was everything yeah experimental psychology, social psychology, personality psychology everything he just analyzed in human beings. So according to his theory there is something called inner force and outer force. Inner force is something which, which is within you. So whatever you think, whatever you feel, everything will come under this in, inner force. Outer force is how others are viewing you. Your family, friends, relatives, all these people, how they view you as a human being and what are their thoughts, everything, how it plays a major role, no? That comes under outer force. So what he is trying to say, his theory says is, individual has an inner and outer force that will affect his perception. Perception is the way of thinking. So this inner force and outer force will create an impact in your perception of thinking something. That is what he tried to say. So I already told you inner force is nothing but your own feelings in motivation and attitude and outer force is nothing but your attitude like for example uh, teacher in a classroom. So teacher may influence the students to do something. Your if you have uh, uh, max as a boring subject, if you think max is a boring subject, it's because of the teacher sometimes. If English is an interesting subject, it's because of the teacher sometimes. So teacher also plays a major role in this outer force thing. So that is what he's trying to say in inner and outer force and then the, the theories are over. Now coming back to the laws. So there are many six laws are there in Gestalt uh, psychology. We can call it as the Gestalt laws. So the first one is law of proximity, law of similarity, second one is similarity, closure, good continuation, good pregnancy and good figure or ground. So first one we will see about law of proximity. Just look at this picture. You can see some more like there is uh, someone is raising their hand something like that is there. But at once if you just see look at this particular object you will be able to find it as a tree so why it is like that why are you able to view it like that because they are closed closely placed between like this image is next to this one this close distance is there between all the images so human mind it when it appears to closer to one another you will tend to group it as a, like you will tend to group it up so you will find it like that for example these are like this far from each other you don't group but still in this white sheet you can just spot this one as a separate one but in this one the same dots you can see it as one triangle shape or something like that so what he is trying to say is proximity so when the objects are closer to each other you can perceive it as a group or entire thing and then is law, comes law of similarity what is law of similarity? So similarity is when they are looking similar or uh, like they tend to see, we tend to see it similar because they, we group it together. For example, all these are jigsaw puzzles. They all are similar to each other and you tend to group it them, group it as a complete thing. No, So you, this is one thing. And then there are these sort of images where the circles and the circles are there and uh, squares are there. You are just grouping them together. So what is this actually? So when we look at objects that are similar to each other, 
we tend to group them together. So that is this one. So if your mind, your brain, what it does is it actually groups the similar objects together. So that is what it does. For example, you can see, I, I'll just tell another example. If you talk, uh, go back to your 12th standard biology and all, human body means under human body you will have uh, the subjects related to human body, heart, brain, liver, all those things, the digestive system, reproductive system, everything will be there, no? It is done because they are similar to each other and that's why they are grouped together. So that's what is law of similarity. And next one is law of closure. In this image, this part and this part is missing. And in this image, here you see lots of missing parts. Similar to, similar to this, here also you can see lots of missing part. But once you look at that image, you can process that image as a whole image. You won't be able to find that incomplete thing. You will be finding it completely. So entire thing you will be seeing even though there are gaps. So in this theory, you will see incomplete elements in a visual by completing the gaps and you will be seeing it as a whole. So that's what they are trying to say. Again, another example which they are trying to tell is, you are given a subject or you are given a subject or uh, maths problem to solve. And in, your, in that question paper, there are about 100 questions and you're stuck up with the eighth question. Just, just imagine like that. What will happen? In, if that, in that eighth question, if you have lots of problems, you will be stuck with that. You will not see the entire thing, but you'll be stuck with that particular thing. So you will try to close the incomplete gaps and then go to the next thing. So that is what they're trying to say in this law of closure. And then comes law of good continuation. So I know generally what a human eye does, when there is any pattern, the eye follows it. So good continuity is there and your eye will move on to that particular image or pattern. Here you can see, if it is like this, you will be able to see the image like this and here it goes like this. So you are able to see that object, the way the path, the, it created a path. So you can just see that eye continues in the direction it is going. So it predicts the presence for continuous figures. So continuous figures, the same thing. And for this, you can give an example. Uh, any teacher, before taking the next chapter, they do a review. They do a revision. Why do they do that? It is because you will have a good knowledge about that, and then you can pursue that with the next subject. So that's why they do this continuation thing. So that is this theory. And next comes the law of good pregnance. Pregnance is nothing but good figure. You can also call it as good figure. So. If you take this complex image, this one, your mind will process it into a simpler one, even though you are not conscious about that. It is it processes it like, like this, a rectangle, an inverted uh, triangle, and an oval. So your mind processes it like that. Even though it is a very complex image, it processes it like that. So that is what they are trying to say in this uh, pregnancy, law of good pregnancy. And then comes law of figure or ground. This is very simple. So just consider me as, a fo as an object and this is the background. So when there is a background, the mind has the power to separate the background from the object. So you'll be able to separate the object from the background and you'll be able to view that as an object. So that's what they're trying to say. See, per separate whole figures from their background on one or more possible variables. So variables may be different based upon the dress, based upon the uh, color or everything. No, it, it, is it is dependent on that. So that is what they're trying to say in this law of figure or ground. So now all the laws are over and the theories are over, coming to the merits of gestalt psychology. So gestalt psychology is like, it is a role of motivation and it has like how to learn, how, how you can learn something like that, they'll be teaching on that. And then the second one is how you perceive it and how you intelligently process that particular task, everything will come under that. So how it is generally like the stimulus and the response, how you respond to a particular situation, you know, that you can just develop that skill. And then it has impacted in the field of psychology. Yeah, the slow learners, all those people, no, they will be, uh, because, because you teach this gestalt psychology and implement this gestalt psychology, there is a chance where you can improve their memory and learning. And then criticism. Criticism is actually the negative points. So negative points is like uh, a general criticism. The ma major thing is it does not talk about emotion or a personality of a particular person. And Predict prediction power is less because we have behavioral school and all where they will be talking about the entire behavior of that particular person. But still here it is not like that. So this is one thing and the next one is you are not learning by parts. So each part you are not focusing on it. You are talking about the entire thing or the complete thing. So what happens is 
you are not focusing on the individual's problem which is a very small thing so that's what so you're seeing it as a whole and you're not concentrating on that and yes this is over it's over so tomorrow we will see the next one thank you